Hello, my is Tim here again, here in my review for Hellraiser Dead Debtor, which is the stupidest fucking title I've ever heard, uh, Debtor. I mean, when, some, when somebody told me, I knew a guy who told me about this, said, hey man, have you seen the new Hellraiser film, Hellraiser Debtor? I thought the guy was honestly joking when he told me the title was Hellraiser Debtor, but then I looked it up, and it was actually the title, and I got blown away that they would actually call the movie fucking Debtor. <laughs> Now, if you do some research on this film, the, the Debtor was originally a different script, and then they uh, reworked it into a Hellraiser film, and you can tell so easily here, because this film has like, got holes in the story, like almost big enough to drive a semi-truck through, and shit in this movie makes no fucking sense at all. I, some shit in this movie makes no sense. None. No sense. It can't just almost can't be explained. Uh, we jump into the film here. We got Carrie Woolver, uh, I think that's how you say her last name. She's been in a, a couple of movies that I've seen. I know she's an eight-legged freak, and she's in a few others. Uh, uh, genre fans know her, but she's all right. Her acting in this film is better than Dean Winters was in the last film because she actually shows emotion, unlike Dean Winters. This film, although I'll just go ahead and say is a two-star film, uh, only a fairly passable two-star film. The last film was like an okay two-star film. This film's like a barely passable two-star film. It's not a horrible film, but the plot is just all over the place. So bad. Um, once again, you get uh, stupid-ass dream-within-a-dream shit. I'll go ahead and say, though, this film feels more like a Hellraiser film than Part 5 or 6. Because this film is told more straightforward and not really like dream-within-a-dream type thing. Although we do get a little bit of that, this film isn't really, isn't really like that doesn't really play on those kinds of levels like 5 and 6 did, or at least 6 anyway, especially 6. But, um, so we got Carrie Woolworth, who is a, who's a reporter. Um, she's like, uh, you get a funny scene at the beginning where she's like investigating like a fucking, like, how to be a crack whore or whatever, or like what is what, cra uh, investigating crack addicts. She's like pretending to be a crack addict. It's kind of funny. She, uh, she goes back, she's got uh, to her company and she's got the story. Um, and fucking, like, her paper's there, and it says, How to Be a Crack Whore by Amy Klein. <laughs> oh, that was funny, like, How to Be a Crack Whore by Amy Klein. That's funny, just that title is to me. And so her boss gets this in, gets in this new fucking, uh, uh videotape that's, uh, got, like, this, uh, cult on it called The Debtors. Again, stupid fucking name, The Debtors. But it's got this dude on there named Winter, who is, like, who fucking, uh, is, uh, well, each one of the cult members will kill themselves, and then he will, like, breathe life back into them with the kiss of life. So he's, like, some kind of cultist, uh, wannabe Jesus figure, in a way. Um, but he'll, like, breathe life back into people. Um, so this girl, like, shoots herself on the tape, and he breathes life back into her and brings her back. So, uh, her boss, you know, Charles, automatically says, She shit together, here's your passport, get the fuck out of Dodge, investigate the story. <laughs> he sends her there tape is sent by a girl named Marla who like wants Amy Klein's help for some reason okay now this film goes back to the basics of like only certain people can open the box only certain people now I just want to get this straight so Winter's plan or whoever the fuck's plan I don't know it says Marla supposedly is the one that sent the package but Winter is the one that wants her there so I'm like what the fuck but anyway because Marla wants something completely different than what Winter does. She acts like she wants help. Or maybe she's on it. Maybe she's in on it too the whole time. And just turns sympathetic towards Amy. I don't fucking know. It doesn't explain it. This film is full of holes. It was rushed to include the Hellraiser elements. And the story has potential. A story of a cult trying to use the box to gain power from it. That's a cool story. Like I said, this film feels more like a Hellraiser film than the last two films. And that still doesn't make it good. Because it's full of fucking plot holes. Uh, this is not a good movie. But, uh, so my point is, is that what Winter, what was his plan? Just to send this tape in to this, uh, fucking place and hope that whatever reporter comes to investigate randomly knows how to open the box? It's like the stupidest fucking plan ever. And if he has supernatural abilities to where he can detect who can open the box and who can't, uh, <laughs> fucking explain it. But anyway, so she goes there to investigate it. She goes into Marla's apartment. She's there. Like Marla's there hanging with her eyes rolled back in her head. Of course, we know she's got the box in her hand, and Amy's reaching for the box. And, of course, we fucking know that she's going to jump out at her eventually. But they, you know, hold off on it for a little while. But she eventually does leap out at her, and I'm like, oh, great, predictable fucking jump scare, yada, yada. 
enough of that shit. I hate that predictable jump scare shit. So we get that stupid ass scene. Um, all through the movie, she's having like flashbacks of her abusive father, but they never explain really like how why, how he was abusing her. Was he like beating on her with the belt, or was he molesting her? It doesn't explain. Um, I guess he might have been molesting her. I don't know. We see him take off his belt in flashbacks. I don't know if that's to whoop the shit out of her or to molest her. I, I don't know. Either way, they're both pretty bad, but, you know, I don't know. Maybe I just want some clarification on that, but whatever. Um, she keeps having flashbacks about that. She's trying to deal with that trauma, I guess. And, um, of course, she wants to investigate the debtors. Uh, she goes to investigate them. Uh, she's, like, she gets stuck between, like, these two walls. We get some CGI cockroaches or bugs or whatever that look like shit. This film feels more low budget than 5 and 6, especially more low budget than 5. 5 seemed like it had a pretty decent sized budget. Uh, 6 seemed like it had a pretty decent uh, to okay budget. And this movie feels like it just has an okay budget. It feels cheaper than 5 and 6, but it doesn't not bad though. I mean, it's, the film doesn't look cheap, except for the CGI cockroaches really. Other than that, the effects and stuff in it and everything hold up fine. But there's some CGI cockroaches or bugs or whatever, and that's like shit. Um, and then this dude, like, starts stabbing her in the back while she's in between the walls, and, uh, she, all at once she fucking you know, just, like, wakes up, and, or no, the, all at once, like, the wall, she disappears from in between the walls, and then this dude is standing there and tells her to follow him to go see Winter, or whatever, and so it's like, you know, another illusion thing, did it happen, did it, didn't, didn't it happen kind of thing, again, reminiscent of Six, uh, which I'm fucking getting tired of, but I'll kind of let that one go, because that's the only time it's happened so far, and the film has been gone, has been on for a little while now, so they kind of shy away from the dream within a dream stuff on 5 and 6 here, but they still have it a little bit, but not too much. This story, like I've said, is more straightforward, so she goes there, she sees Winter resurrecting some, some guy, bringing him back to life, and, uh, it's kind of creepy here. This, this one thing I'll give it, the film here is a little creepy, this scene is, because the dude that took her there, she sees his wrists, and his wrists are, like, slashed, and he's pointing towards Winter and telling Amy to follow him. She, she, she wants more information and shit, and, like, everybody there has, like, a different wound on them from where they've killed themselves and had him bring them back to join his cult. Um, that's kind of neat. Uh, but she goes there to talk to him, and for some reason he has the ability to super speed, and he can go, like, he goes fat, he goes like super speed uh, for a second, trying to be the Flash or something, like runs up to her, uh, and they're trying to do a dramatic moment, but uh, the super speed scene kind of looks a little cheesy. Uh, maybe it's just me, I don't know, it just looked cheesy to me, and he's like talking to her about shit and all that, and about how um, how the fucking puzzle box is his birthright, and how he's using it, using the puzzle box or something like that, he wants to use it or is using it, he found some pathway in it. Where he can fucking, uh, I don't know, do something there. Like he wants to take over stuff or do something. It never explains what the fuck he really wants to do with the puzzle box. Um, but we got a scene uh, earlier where Amy opens the fucking box. Uh, she wa What's funny is she watches a tape that Marla, another tape that she found in Marla's apartment that says, don't open the box. And so immediately after it's over, she opens the damn box. And then fucking chain shoot out and grab her on the head and Pinhead all at once appears and says, Don't think for a second that you're not in danger. And then he just disappears. And then it goes away like nothing ever happened. And uh, she's back to normal. No chains, nothing. And I'm like, Pinhead, if you've got a problem with Winter and you need her help or you need to tell her something, fucking say it. Don't just spout off two lines and then disappear. That is just fucking stupid. I mean, if you got something to say, say it. Part four, we can never get you to shut the fuck up. And then here, you, you, take, you won't say anything whatever, um, but, back to what I was saying, she goes out to visit Winter, and Winter tells her a bunch of shit that's never picked up on, or never followed through, uh, completely in the script for some unknown fucking reason, because this film was rushed to include the Hellraiser elements, and they didn't, they didn't plot everything out correctly, uh, but, so eventually, she keeps going on this train, uh, before that, she would go on this train to talk to this guy named Joey, and you got, like, these two lesbians making out, like, in front of Joey or whatever, and, um, lesbians, fine, you know, lesbians in your movie, nothing wrong with that, but, uh, I mean, I don't have a problem with watching lesbians or anything, but, either way, the scene goes on too long, it feels really gratuitous, feels like it's really put in there just to say, hey, guys, just watch this, maybe this will take your mind off the huge plot holes in the film, but whatever, I thought that was a little stupid. But uh, Joey's there, he's like this goofy fucking uh, 
English guy or whatever. <laughs> but uh, on the train, there's like a bunch of just people fucking and shit and just random weird shit hung up everywhere. Uh, later on, when she's on the train, like everybody like on the train just saw it once. This, the, it goes black inside the train, then the lights come back on, everyone in there's dead, and you got bodies laying everywhere. And some people are just like laying there with fake blood smeared on them. Like you can just tell they got fake blood smeared on them. And then one Cenobite appears and he's like stitching somebody's neck. And uh, that's it. It just appears right there and then that's it. Uh, once again, Pinhead pretty much gets the spotlight in this movie. Um, similar to 6. His scenes in 6 were better than the ones in here and flowed better with the story in part 6. Even though this film feels more like a Hellraiser film, Pinhead's scenes in this film are, and the Cenobite scenes are weaker. Like the Cenobite who's like stitching the person's throat on the train feels really thrown in there. Um, until the end, I like Pinhead's screen time at the end of the film, though, in the climax. I'll give it that. I enjoyed that. But, um, so you got the train scene. Now, that was later in the film. Um, talk about some other scenes here from the film. Um, Winter, basically, I, he needs her to open the box because no one else can. And I guess he's using, uh, what he's been doing is recruiting people. One at a time, maybe, to see if each, testing each one of them, they could open the box. But why does he want to open the box? Why? If he opens the box, Pinhead's going to come out and fucking kill him. Because he's trying to abuse the power of the box. So what's the point? And if he thinks that he's gained enough power to where he can fight Pinhead, why does he think that? Why? Pinhead can rip people apart into fucking nothing. So why does this guy think that he can fight Pinhead one-on-one -on -one just because he's got a couple of dead teenagers with him? Who can easily be ripped to pieces by big fucking chains. I don't get it. It makes no fucking sense. What does he hope to accomplish? What is this guy trying to achieve by opening this fucking box? What is he wanting to gain? It makes no fucking sense, and it never goes into detail. But anyway, so I get it. The Amy Klein's like the only person that he knows can open the box. That's great. That that's, makes sense. Total sense. But what the fuck is the purpose? So he needs her to like accept him. Like, so he can have her soul and she'll be on his side and a member of his team. But once again, what the fuck does that matter? He needs this, he needs Amy Klein to commit suicide voluntarily for him. But, but, she gets stabbed in the back in the film. And fucking, like, she starts, uh, you get a really cool scene where she's, like, got the knife in her back. And Carrie Wooler, like, plays it really great. Her acting is really good here. And this is the best scene in the film where she's got the knife in her back. And it's, like, coming at her chest. And the tip is, like, right through here. That's fucking badass. The makeup effects and the effect for that is really good. Uh, that was cool. And she's got, like, she puts it, like, between, like, a like a door or something like that. And, like, fucking, like, holds it back and then pulls forward. And it comes all the way out. Uh, through her back. That was a really cool scene, and she like fucking puts duct tape around the wound. That was a cool scene. That was that was the best scene in the whole movie. But you get other dream within dream shit where she's like, first time I believe that she gets off the train. I think it's either she gets off or gets on. I didn't pay too much attention to this movie. I'll be honest, because even though it's not a horrible movie, it just feels like we're, like the franchise is nearing nearing its death. It feels like it's getting there. Hell, where's the franchise does? It needs something more to rejuvenate it. And uh, the whole cold idea and everything is cool, but it's just not enough. Um, but uh, she sees Winter like jump in front of the train and get hit by the train, and then of course he disappears and never got hit by the train. So it's like more did it happen? Didn't it happen? Shit. So it's like yeah, the fuck. But uh, she keeps having more hallucinations, hallucinations of her father, and the character Marla is like there in like a zombified form, like trying to help her. Like, figure out what the fuck's going on and trying to guide her. I think what it is, it doesn't explain it good enough, but I think what it is is that she has, um, like, she got killed with the knife in the back, I guess. Uh, after she had opened the box, I guess. So she got killed with a knife in the back, and she, uh, when she got knife, she was actually killed by it. And she has to face her own demons before she can come back. And so she has to face what happened to her father. And what happened to her father was is that she got tired of his abuse and fucking stabbed him and killed him. Um, <laughs> so that's what happened to him. She has to face that, that, that she actually did that and that happened. Um, that was an okay scene, seeing that flashback. But then she wakes back up and she's back with Winter in the bed. <laughs> and uh, he needs her to commit suicide voluntarily. Okay, now answer me this. If she has seen all this stuff already and had the knife in her back and everything, uh, how did she see all that shit? Because I'm assuming that that's what she's seen in, like, her own hell, maybe, or her, or, like, 
or from after she opened the puzzle box? Like, why is she seeing all this shit? Why? Is it supposed to be after she opened the puzzle box once already and she's, like, seeing all this shit because it's, like, in Pinhead's Dominion or whatever? This is what it looks like in his place and she's got this as, like, her own hell or whatever and she's got to face her demons in it and all that shit and make her way back out of it. But if she did that and she already was, was stabbed by Marla uh, <laughs> before this happened, wouldn't she already be dead? So why does he need her to kill herself again? I don't fucking get that. Unless she had already killed herself. Uh, but we see her the first time she opened the box. So she couldn't have already have killed herself before then. It, it, doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense. Why is she seeing all this shit? Is it because she's in her own hell and has to face her own demons and make it out? Because they make a point to say that she needs to face her own demons and make it out. Like I'm saying the script is muddled. It's muddled. They... They don't flesh it out enough. They, it's very, really hard to decide or to determine what the fuck is going on in this movie. Uh, you get a few cool scenes though, um, but uh, so she wakes back up and uh, she decides, "Fuck you, winner! I'm not giving my soul to you." I guess he wants her soul for, and wants her to join his team, his debtor team, for no fucking reason. I don't see what the big deal is. Just because she can open the box. The fuck's that mean? When she opens it, Pinhead's just gonna come out and fucking obliterate you, regardless of who opens it. So what does it matter? <laughs> but uh, so she decides, fuck you, winner, and doesn't kill herself and takes the box and opens it. Pinhead comes out. Pinhead fucking obliterates Winner in the coolest scene in the movie. Kills him just like Frank was killed in the first movie, or really, well, not exactly, but really similar. So he gets ripped to fucking pieces. Serves his character right for being a dumbass, uh, taking thinking he could take on Pinhead. And fucking, um, what's, uh, what's kind of interesting is they make his character at the end, you find out that he's actually a descendant of, uh, the toy maker from Hellraiser Bloodline. That's mildly interesting. Um, I can, you can tell, though, if they kind of threw that in there just to say, it does have a connection to Hellraiser. It does. It does. I mean, I kind of like that connection, really, how he is a descendant of, uh, the Bloodline, but how does he have superpowers? How can he bring people back to life? How is he even able to do that? If he opened the box and got that power somehow from opening the box, when he opened it, why didn't Pinhead just kill him? But he can't open it, so he needed Amy Klein to open it, so how did he get this power? The toy maker bloodline does not have supernatural power. And if he's just born with it or he's a fucking X-Men mutant, explain it. You know, fucking explain it, movie, explain it. Uh, there's good ideas in here, but it, they're not fleshed out. They're just not fucking fleshed out. But um, the more I think about it, the more my fucking head hurts. Uh, but, um, uh, so he kills Winter, then you get a scene where he, like, takes two big fucking chains, like, fly out and go through all the other people, and, uh, you kind of get, Pinhead gets some cool lines here, I do like the lines he has, Doug Bradley, once again, is fine in this movie, um, Pinhead's lines are really good here, I like his lines, where he's like, uh, allow me to finish what he started, after all, this world must disappoint you, or something like that, or this life must disappoint you all. Because you gave yourself so willingly over to him and allow me to finish what he started. And the fucking chain shoot out and there's like a whole line of people on both sides, right and left. And they fucking get a uh, chain shoved all the way through uh, every one of them. Uh, one line gets took out. One line of people gets took out on the right. Another line of people gets took out on the left. And one big massive chain like goes through every one of them in the, in the rows. Uh, that was cool. But then after they're all dead, fucking Joey... He's standing there, and he's got a hole in his gut, and he goes, Oh, for fuck's sake! And then falls over, and I'm like, that, I admit that fucking made me laugh, but why is that in the movie? Why is that comedy there that doesn't fit at all? That scene does not fit at all. It's funny as fuck, I'll admit. It is funny. It made me fucking laugh. But why is it in the movie? It doesn't fit the tone. This film is trying to go for a more serious, darker tone. Uh, it, it doesn't fit. It feels out of place. But... How the way, so they're all dead, and they're wanting to, Pinhead wants her soul, wants to take her soul to hell, and he tells her her dad is there, uh, waiting for her, uh, I guess he's lonely, and so she fucking commits suicide, so Pinhead can't take her soul, can't take her soul to hell, uh, I think, well, I'm pretty sure it's the Catholics who believe if you commit suicide, you go to hell anyway, so, <laughs> I don't believe that personally, but, uh, just to, just to think about that for a second. I mean, she commits suicide, takes her own life, so Pinhead can't take her life to hell. Um, it might be the filmmaker's way of trying to say that 
the hell that is uh, that Pinhead takes you to is a different hell than the regular afterlife that you might go to. But if that's the case, then why the fuck is her dad there? Unless Pinhead was just fucking with her, but it doesn't seem like he would fuck with her with something like that. That kind of seems like it's definitely there. That line is there for a reason. Um, so if she does commit suicide, I guess it's just because she didn't give her life to him or Winter. She just decided to kill herself. Um, so either way, she took her own life out with her own hands. So either way, Pinhead doesn't get her life because she didn't give herself over to him voluntarily. But it's still, I don't, what's weird is, uh, she's like, uh, she's gonna kill herself. And Marla's laying there dying from the big chain that just went through everybody, including her. Uh, and she's fucking telling him, telling her only Winter can bring you back. And I thought she was already fucking dead. It made it seem like that and, and that everything she was seeing was that like her own personal afterlife or whatever, and that she had to make her way back up through it. And if it wasn't, then what the fuck was everything she saw? I mean, what? And if she opened the puzzle box and went and went to hell, and then Winter somehow brought her back from hell, uh, fucking explain it. But whatever. What the fuck ever. Uh, and he and she tells her that only yeah only Winter can bring you back, and I'm like, what? if all Winter needed was for her to just kill herself, and then him to bring her back. Why the fuck w didn't he just fucking tell her that, or get her to just come down there automatically, instead of all this big mystery shit, why didn't he just go to her and say, get her to come down there and get her interested in all that shit, and then get her to do it. And another thing is, he didn't even really get her interested in anything, or really get her to do it. I mean, so why the fuck would he think that she would commit suicide for him? I don't get that. Why would she think that? I mean, why would he think that? Because he's a fucking moron, that's why. But anyway, um, so she kills herself, and then you get this really over-the-top scene, where, where the puzzle box, of course, you know, it has no soul to take, so it's closing itself back, and all the, the Cenobites are going back to hell, and... Pinhead's the only Cenobite that matters here. The rest of Cenobite's worthless. Uh, Pinhead's going back to hell, and he, he looks at the camera and goes, No! <laughs> I'm like, that's so overly dramatic. It's so fucking silly. You don't need that at all. But whatever. So that happens. Um, Pinhead goes back to hell, and you get kind of a... I do like this really sad scene at the end. It's really sad um, where her boss... Uh, fucking, uh, now that Amy's dead and gone, uh, new, uh, like a, a woman shows up trying to apply for a job, uh, he basically just gives her Amy's job, and, uh, it's like he doesn't even care that she's gone and just gives her Amy's job, and it focuses on a picture of, like, Amy and, uh, and Charles in a picture together, like, he, he never cared about her through the entire, entire film, he doesn't give a fuck about her, like, he's, he, to be honest, his character, if you actually pay attention to him, is more despicable than Pinhead, really. <laughs> which is kind of funny. So he just replaces her, and that's the end of the movie. It's like showing that he doesn't, you know, give a fuck. I thought that was kind of a sad, lonely way to end the movie on, like a sad note, and I kind of like that. Uh, but other than that, this film has good ideas, like the cult and everything, and the character of Winter, like, resurrecting people, but it never goes into what's he, what does he want, what's his ultimate goal, what is he trying to accomplish? How does he ever expect to go one-on-one -on -one with Pinhead? How does he ever expect to have the power to fight Pinhead back? Because when Pinhead shows up, Winter is like, you can't hurt me. And Pinhead's like, you're not the first to say that. And you won't be the last. And I'm like, why the fuck does he think Pinhead can't hurt him? Where the fuck did he get that from? Just because you may have came back from the dead uh, doesn't mean that Pinhead still can't hurt you. He can rip your fucking body to pieces. If your body's ripped to pieces, regardless of whether you're still alive, you're not going to be able to fucking do anything. But I'm anyway. So as far as this film goes, it's got some good ideas, but none of them's fleshed out because this wasn't originally a Hellraiser script, and it was the Hellraiser elements feel forced in. Uh, they feel forced in, but at the same time, just the feel of this film, like the dark feel of it and the straightforward feel and the less like dream within a dream feel, makes it feel more like a Hellraiser film than 5 or 6. But 5 is a much better uh, written movie and better structured. And 6 is... 6 flows better. The story of 6 is less interesting than the story of this movie with the cult and everything because you already basically know how 6 is going to play out. But the story of 6 is still more satisfying because it makes fucking sense. Uh, so once again, this is just, 
a, a low two star film. This is only a a barely okay film. Uh, uh, number six was just an okay film. This film right here is like a barely okay film. Number seven is not horrible. Uh, if you're a fan, I would say watch it. If you've watched one through six, fucking watch this one too. Uh, but you can feel the decline of the series by this point. You can feel it. It's starting. It's a. You can feel like right around the corner, there's going to be a really shitty one coming up next with Hellraiser Hell World. <laughs> so I'll see you guys again with Hellraiser Hell World, and then I'll see you guys again finally with Hellraiser Revelations, which I am not looking forward to, and I've never even seen it, and I'm still not looking forward to it. Uh, I'll be honest, if it wasn't for these reviews, I would never watch Hellraiser Revelations. Not ever. Not ever. But as far as it goes for the character of Pinhead, in the first two movies, he's like an explorer of pleasure and pain and a soldier for Leviathan. Three and four, he's a fucking world-dominating demon. Uh, um, five, he's like a, he's pretty much, bad, uh, he, he's a demon fucking like exploring some, a guy's character, I guess you could say, and, and he's moral judge at the end of it. And then in fucking six, he's back similar to the way he was in uh, part one and two, back to being uh, like a servant of the box, like open the box, he shows up, whatever, but he doesn't really give a shit about pain and pleasure. It's not, those traits aren't really, uh, brought up very much and aren't really part of his character that much in that one. Uh, seven, he's back to being, once again, like a servant of the box or whatever, but he's more demonic. And then eight, we'll get there. We'll get there. I'll just say it. He, eight, he's basically a slasher villain. And nine, he is not in it. That is not Pinhead. He is not in that movie. Fuck that movie up the ass. Fuck it up the ass. I will see you guys again uh, with uh, Hell Wears or Hell World. Hey, sorry about that little jump cut right there, but uh, I just wanted to say for people who hadn't seen my review for Hell Wears or Hell Seeker yet, that in that review I say that that film's a two-star film, but after re-watching it uh, a second time after I'd already watched it once, I found I was a little bit too hard on the film and decided to give it two and a half stars. I still have all the same problems with it that I did before, but the one scene at the end of the film uh, that I didn't pay attention to when I watched it the first time helped uh, me amp it up to uh, at least a two and a half to just being from an okay to a decent film. But if you want more information on it, uh, just watch, you know, the Hellraiser Hellseeker review. And if you've already seen it, I'm sorry for adding this in, but I like to clarify about what, you know, how many stars I give each film. And I want to make sure that whatever star rating I do give a film is the star rating I really feel is appropriate for it. And two and a half stars is what I truly feel is appropriate for that film. It's only a decent film, but it does still feel like been there, done that, and the same old shit, different day. So I'll see you guys again with Hellraiser Hellworld review.